to be an unoriginal hack is one rather small step for film as a whole, but one giant leap for Disney Pixar. It's the first big screen spin-off of Toy Story, which is not only the studio's oldest franchise, but also one of its most beloved. However, while Lightyear marks a very important milestone for both Disney and Pixar, it's not actually the first time Buzz would be launched from the intimate setting of Andy's hometown to outer motherfucking space. That's right, back in 2000, the Space Ranger would get a much more humble spin-off film in the form of Buzz Lightyear of Star Command. The Adventure Begins. The series that would spawn this film actually began life while Toy Story 2 was in development as a direct-to-video sequel. It was a whole thing spurred on by the success of Disney's first straight-to-VHS sequel, The Return of Jafar. A direct follow-up to Aladdin that for some reason dropped its titular hero's name from the title. The show was originally planned to come out before what we now know as the juggernaut that is Toy Story 2. However, that would change when an executive at Disney argued that it was basically the equivalent of stepping on the sequel's non-existent toes, which I suppose makes sense now that Toy Story 2 was being made for the big screen. With the series itself being put on hold, Tad Stones, who was not only responsible for the aforementioned Aladdin sequel, but a boom of profitable direct-to-video sequels as well. Along with series writers Bob Shuley and Mark McCorkle, who were two of the creative forces behind Kim Possible, as well as Sky High, and the rest of the Star Command team would begin work on the pilot. The staff crafting it into the film Buzz Lightyear of Star Command, The Adventure Begins, to later be split into the first three episodes of the series. With so much of the series already finalized, the team was able to put their budget and time into new things just for the movie. You know what that means? A lot more locations. Oh, and making Tim Allen redub Buzz's line, since he wasn't attached to the project until quite a bit later on meaning he had to completely match Patrick Warburton's line reading, since Warburton had already recorded everything for the film prior. You are clear for emergency liftoff. Roger that. Power down your engines. Unfortunately, Mira, the commander doesn't agree with us. With all that in mind, this film should be one hell of an adventure. So let's get into it and see how well Buzz's first journey into the final frontier holds up. The film starts in Andy's room in a sequence crafted in Pixar's signature CGI stylings. That's right, this whole film is actually an isekai. <laughs> Not really, but can you imagine Buzz just getting hit by a bus and being sent into the science fantasy world his toy was based on? <laughs> what, it's better than the time they isekai Batman? Anyway, in a rather self-masturbatory scene, the other little green men of the Toy Story universe bring in the package. The package itself being the now ancient technology, the videotape. And on it is today's subject. And in typical Rex fashion, he's more excited for the Buzz Lightyear movie than the Buzz Lightyear toy is. Also, Buzz's face when they're trolling Rex and Woody says they're only going to watch the commercials at the beginning should be fucking illegal. Seriously, look at this smug asshole. This is the look of a toy who knows the power he has to crush that poor dinosaur's hopes and dreams right then and right there if he really wanted to. Rex is pushed too far and he fucking dies. <laughs> Also, since I have no idea where else I'd address this, since it's barely noticeable anyway, I'll do it here. Woody and Ham's actors didn't return for the sequence. Instead, Tom Hanks' brother Jim Hanks took over as Woody, and Andrew Stanton, who played Zerg in Toy Story 2, filled in as Han, marking the first and only time so far a Pixar character played by John Ratzenberg had been voiced by someone else. Anyway, the gang starts the film, and would you look at that? Things are now all 2D. Look, Mr. Lightyear, can I call you Mr. Lightyear? 
you may just want to retire now because you're never going to catch up to your partner's extensive list of achievements. Frankly, your lack of them, it's embarrassing. After the audience is briefed on the two rangers' mission, Buzz can't help himself but force his catchphrase in. We'll find and rescue these little green men, even if we must go to infinity and beyond. However, Warp thinks he's had enough monologuing for the day and interrupts him while he's recording a mission log. No sign of the missing personnel. Hey! Come on, buddy. Nobody ever reads those reports. Wait, reads? why don't those send us audio logs? Wouldn't that make much more sense? Procedure is what separates us from the wicked forces of chaos. Ha, ah, Buzz. If it means less paperwork, I'll take chaos. This man is definitely on the up and up. Anyway, the two take off to check the dark side of the crater in their rather stylish buggy. Driving down the streets in the fancy car. Ah! These three couldn't have picked a better time to do this. It had to be mid fucking air. I don't think these are the three missing little green men. Sure, not anymore. The only way they could have made this man any more obviously a traitor is by playing this clip every time he does something suspicious. Green, green, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more. According to the LGMs, their missing pals are close. Their mind link detects not only the lost ones, but evil. And in response, Buzz delivers this rousing speech. This diabolical plot can only be the work of the sworn enemy of the Galactic Alliance, evil Emperor Zerg. Warp responding like any sane person would in his shoes. What plot? You think Zerg is behind every kitten stuck up a tree? The fiend. Why can't he leave kitty cats out of his nefarious schemes? Wait, does this mean Buzz has actually caught Zerg? putting cats in trees? Because if so, that's actually pretty hilarious and I would pay to see it. All I know is we've searched half of the Zeta Quadrant to find the missing LGMs and what do we find? A lot of nothing! There's something really bad behind me, isn't there? Hey look, Warp literally walked into a cliche. The Crater Vipers attack and the Little Green Men make the brilliant decision to wander off in the middle of an action scene. Does that Unimine not come with, you know, common sense? Or do they have to pay extra for that? Fortunately, Buzz notices, and he and Warp are able to provide cover for the ILSs, aka irresponsible little shits. I should have guessed a Crater Viper Slag Monster Mutant. The name seems excessive, but I'm going to let it pass. Because while that and the design are both pretty goofy, Chalmi thought this was the coolest thing in the world. The Unimine has led these little guys to what basically amounts to attempted suicide twice in this movie. I'm almost convinced it doesn't come with survival instincts at this point. Buzz and Warp then copy a move they saw in Star Wars in dispatch of the Crater Viper Slag Monster Mutant. This uncovers the very subtle entrance to Zerg's subterranean outpost. I love that in this film made for children, the villain has a torture division just straight up addressed as such. Even the US government wasn't this bold. Hey, the adventure begins. I love you. I do, but I think you've subverted expectations so much, it can no longer be considered subversion. See? Look, it's going to be Zerg this time. Oh, no, what? Yeah. <laughs> didn't like it. That said, this introduction is amazing. Zerg is sold to the audience as a threat immediately, with how much fear he fills his own subordinates with, and just how sadistic he is. Something made even more impressive, considering the writing doesn't sacrifice the series' trademark humor 
to sell Zerg as a believable threat. Buzz and Warp manage to infiltrate the lab. The LGMs end up taking along, though, despite Buzz's very rational protest. And since every good pilot needs a healthy dose of exposition, Warp hasn't been filled in on the whole LGM mindling thing. So Buzz explains to him that all the little guys are connected to a hive mind called the Unimind. Tell me your secret. No, I'll just have to pick your brains. <laughs> Where's my cranial dissector boss? <laughs> Holy shit, this movie's about to get metal. Ah, uh, god damn it. Should have realized that wasn't going to happen, though. There's no way I wouldn't have remembered seeing the cute little green men from Toy Story getting their heads opened up had I seen it as a kid. I was mentally scarred by Les back then. How you doing, Silent Hill Uzagi? And even lamer, the zombies from Batman, the animated series. You are hereby charged with attempted dissection of Star Command personnel. That is a very oddly specific charge which likely means that this is something that has happened a lot, which is actually pretty fucking dark. And let's not forget metal. This also makes me really curious what other oddly specific laws Star Command has though. Getting back to the film itself, Zerg escapes while Buzz single-handedly frees the LGMs and takes out a bunch of Hornets. Where's Warp? Coming in the same way Zerg left, that's, uh, that's not suspicious at all. And this is apparently just normal for him. Seems really shady, but I guess Buzz is cool with it. Can't see this turning out badly at all. Get to the ship! Blast off! All right! Now where the fuck did the incredible disappearing warp go? Well, that's a shitty magic trick. You should know escape artists aren't supposed to put themselves in situations they can't get out of warp. Your warp dark matter sacrificed himself for the success of his mission. I get that this is quite dark, being that it's a children's film and all, but my main takeaway from this scene is actually much less about that, and more that I'm really going to miss Warp and Buzz's dynamic as partners. Something that as far as I'm aware, they only really ever explore once more in the series. That being in the episode Tag Team, where the two are forced to team up once more, and it's Definitely one of my favorite episodes that I've seen so far. Oh, I just talked through the somber scene about Buzz and Star Command mourning the death of their fallen comrade, didn't I? Oh well, anyway, we next meet Commander Nebula. And I didn't realize this until I saw it on IMDb, but the Commander is actually played by Adam Carolla who you may know best for his role as the host of The Man Show that didn't become an obnoxious talk show host you wish would just go the fuck away. The best way I can describe Nebula is a mix between a space sheriff, a space pirate, and that very specific stereotype described so eloquently by Ice Cube's character in 21 Jump Street. I know what you're thinking. Angry? Black cat. It ain't nothing but a stupid stereotype. Which makes the fact that he's played by a white guy just a teeny bit awkward. But it was the very early aughts, and that was just kind of what Hollywood did back then, I guess. Nebula introduces Buzz and the audience to Mira Nova, who impresses immediately by being the only rookie to pass level 9 of training. However, we find out the real reason she stands out after she uses her ability to become intangible to pass the next level of training. That said, unlike a certain red-haired space pirate with blue skin from Dragon Ball Z, 
who you almost certainly know better from your scrub search history rather than her actual appearance in BoJack Unbound, Merritt does actually have a tangible personality to speak of. Her ability is apparently known as ghosting, which should come in handy if she ever decides to skip out on the bill at a fancy space establishment. Buzz, meet your new partner! I'm sorry, Commander, but from now on, Buzz Lightyear flies solo. Well, he took that well, all things considered. Booster, who I kept referring to as Buster in my notes for God knows what reason, seems like someone who would have been stuffed in a locker in middle or high school. If he fits, that is. I don't know how big his race's lockers are. Gotta run, Booster. <gasps> yes, sir! Uh, Booster. Yes, sir! At ease. <gasps> Thanks, Buzz! You know, I get the passion, and he's got the dedication to become a space ranger. However, I'm pretty sure holding your breath until you drop dead would disqualify someone. A henchman whose first on-screen action is attempted murder. Very nice, very evil. I love that when they introduce Zerg, he's framed in a way that really sells him as intimidating. Then in this scene, they pull the rug out from under you and show you that, while he may be the scourge of the universe, he's still a pretty big dork, all things considered. Good to see Zerg's weird-ass sex doll bot thing being put to good use. I just hope he washed it before taking it out in public like this. Jokes aside, I unironically found this super fucking cool as a kid, and still kind of do now. Even if there's no way this thing wouldn't be spotted by the LGMs immediately. So I guess we're just to assume they're all too preoccupied to notice it. This is where we get our first glimpse at the Unimind, which I like to think is specifically designed to resemble a bouncy ball, to sell just how absurd the claw's integration into Buzz Lightyear of Star Command's lore really is. Having confirmed not only the Unimind's existence, but also its location, Zerg sends his forces to invade the LGM homeworld. Including in war, I, I mean Agent Z, complete with flamethrower. Because there weren't already enough partner candidates between Mira the Warrior Princess and Booster probably has a creepy shrine of Buzz in the janitor's closet, Munchapper, apparently. The LGMs present Buzz with XR. XR meaning Experimental Ranger because it was the early 2000s and X's were cool. Buzz isn't convinced, so in order to sell him on it, the little guys destroy XR. Are, are we sure the Unimind isn't just effective? Okay, they do put him back together in like three seconds tops, but I'm not sure I'm totally convinced he wasn't just more hassle than he's worth. Apparently, Nebula hates robots. So, to get XR approved, the LGM slipped the paperwork in with their vacation request. They apparently do this a lot. So while they should be in deep shit if Commander Nebula answers to someone else, he'd get in just as much trouble for not paying attention every single time. Artificial intelligence chip, XR is programmed to watch and learn. They probably should have led with that. It's not like giving machines AI ever goes wrong. XR would never become the universe's equivalent of Skynet or anything. It also doesn't hurt that they butter buzz up. And he'll be learning from the best. You. True. Buzz loses his shit on everyone for continuing to talk about partners as if he's agreed to take one on. But in the middle of everyone butting heads, the mind link alerts the LGMs to the fact their homeworld, well, it's in a bit of a pickle. I haven't mentioned it yet, but the text gags in this thing are fucking great. You know, this whole new partner thing is going pretty well. Buzz is even warming up to the little box. I, I mean, 
and this is just a minor setback. The LGMs can always just put XR back together again. No big deal, right? You're good, but I'm better. Or not, you know what? I'm just gonna stop talking. Well, I'm not, but... You know what I mean. I guess I was right that he wouldn't become their equivalent of Skynet. This is the kind of shit that leads to Am instead. Ellen! To survive here, in the center of my beating heart, my hungry belly, my tightened bowels. Could, um, hopefully allow you to reach out and ensnare every innocent mind in the Galactic Alliance. You're telling huh? me my plan. I already know my plan. I made up the plan. It's my plan. What I don't know is how close you are to accomplishing my plan. So let me get this straight. Zerg's brain trust, which consists of literal brains and jars, can't figure out how to make Zerg's plan a reality. Is Zerg just grabbing any Tom, Dick, and Harry and making them scientists? This is all made even more ridiculous by the fact that Zerg literally just touches the thing to corrupt it. The scene of Zerg turning the Unimind evil is still as awesome as it is creepy between the visuals and the rather ominous noises the thing begins to make. Which is always rather impressive, considering again, this is a movie for babies. Man, is, uh, would be so proud. <laughs> you know it's an actual crime that we never got to see Nana Zerg in the flesh? You're telling me they were given 62 episodes and couldn't slip in one about an evil mom and son or evil grandma and grandson, I don't know what she is, team up episode but included fucking Santa? Nana Zerg should have been your fucking priority, not the jolly fat man who gives you presents as an excuse to steal your milk and cookies and cuck dad. See? I just gave you the perfect plot. Nana and Zerg kidnapping Santa by leaving him milk and cookies. Maybe leave out the whole cucking thing, since, you know, it's a kid show. But maybe they'd have gotten away with it. I mean, have you seen the things that they did get past the censors? Wait, 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 wait. Well, uh, uh, no, Your Honor, I swear I had no idea she was under warranty. Well, it's just a start. Now take off your pants. Buzz and Nebula are briefing the Rangers on their plan of attack when the new and, uh, improved XR wanders in to give his two cents. Buzz, listen to your trusted partner when I say maybe we've overlooked a little thing I like to call negotiation. Did I say that XR would grow up to be Am? Never mind, I think even Am would think this guy's got a screw loose. Now follow me on this buzz. Two words, timeshare. How many of you love it? All right, Monday through Wednesday, admittedly, the galaxy belongs to Zerg. Did the LGM slip a timeshare brochure in XR when they were stuffing the poor guy like he was in a black video? Mira then comes up with a plan to infiltrate Zerg's defenses unnoticed and she and Buzz get in an argument about who should carry it out. Nebula shooting them both down, planning to launch an assault at 0800 hours. And because Zerg's forces continue to find new and exciting ways to be incompetent, Star Command should have plenty of time to stop them. Speaking of, Buzz and Mira catch each other in the act. of attempting to steal the fancy new ship. You nasty! However, Mira cheats using what I believe is known as the Tangian Rufi power. After regaining consciousness, Buzz chases after Mira in his own ship, two stowaways aboard. He catches up to Mira and captures her, and they're greeted with quite the surprise. Got me red Literally, too, in the case of Booster, even if those hands are currently covered by gloves. And judging by Mira's reaction, she's not a fan of big, beautiful men. During this, though, the alarm goes off and the Rangers just barely avoid the Ray's beam. Star Command isn't so lucky, though. Not gonna lie, the reveal of the possessed Nebula and the rest of Star Command is actually kind of brilliant. And then, 
just when all hope seems lost, the four escape Star Command through the art of power cleaning. Until they're all killed by a bomb stuck to the ship. And the film just ends really abruptly. You. Being the Joker to Buzz's Batman, Zerg has a super heterosexual morning session for his dearly departed foe. What now? That? That's not a spacecraft. It's obviously a weather balloon. Let's leave the brain work to those with the brain, shall we? I don't even need to say anything at this point, do I? Buzz goes it alone, but won't let XR get a nose ring because he's one of those fascists who think the rules don't apply to them. You know, as a kid, the warp reveal blew my fucking mind. And even as an adult, while it may be the most telegraphed thing on Earth, I honestly kind of love it. I mean, it gives us this exchange. Of course. Amnesia. No. Evil clone. No. Android replica. No. Okay, okay, it's so obvious. Zerg's mind control ray. Buzz says the warp he trains side by side with wouldn't work for Zerg. But let's be real here. Every time we see warp prior to taking up the guise of agency, whether that be the movie or tag team, he's depicted as a pretty slimy individual. Buzz is just incredibly unobservant, and that's sugarcoating it. My name's Dark Matter. I'm surprised here. Hey, that's my job. You stick to yours, and I'll stick to mine, capiche? Realizing he's been made, Lightyear sends out a coded message, disguised as a mission log, that's about as on the nose as the last name Dark Matter. But neither Warp nor Zerg catch on to it being a message. And just as shit's about to get real, the three other rangers save Buzz. Zerg orders Dark Matter to, and I quote, kill Lightyear. What a metal fucking kid show. Then Mira uses literal metal to incapacitate Warp, making him scream like a girl in the process. Target the planet of widows and orphans! That draws Buzz to the battery, and Zerg hits him out of the air while he's blasting it with lasers, with little to no effect. The Rangers take out Dark Matter via boosters, badass! But Zerg ultimately gets away. To truly save the day, Mira pushes Buzz into the Unimind, and because he can't help himself, he has to get one last to infinity and beyond in there. Alright, I won't rob you of it. Here you go. I guess Buzz is Mormon, because he takes Mira, XR, and Booster on as his partners. Or maybe this guy just likes variety. Understandable. Oh, and uh, William Shatner sings the credit song, which is still kind of awesome. Not gonna lie. To infinity and beyond. And that was Buzz Lightyear of Star Command. The adventure begins. So then, how was it? Honestly, pretty damn good. You couldn't tell already by the subtle hints I dropped in this review, I adored this movie as a kid. Alongside the scene in Toy Story 2 that showed off a very cool, but also very, very fictional Buzz Lightyear video game, it was probably my favorite piece of Toy Story media since I really liked, okay, still really like Buzz Lightyear. Don't judge me! That said, this isn't some super complex experience with a masterfully written script that demands your full, undivided attention. After all, this was never meant to be anything more than a fun little detour on the road to Toy Story 2. And while plans changed, the incredibly talented team behind this stayed the course. And it's thanks to that, and their flexibility, that Buzz Lightyear of Star Command The Adventure Begins exists in the first place, and that it also turned out as good as it did. Hell, they saw this as an opportunity to make the pilot better, and they took it. Something that's incredibly admirable. It's a shame there don't seem to be any plans to put this and the rest of the series on Disney+, or make it easily available anywhere, really. 
despite the fact right now is the perfect time to capitalize on it with Lightyear coming out so, so soon. I mean, sure, I can poke fun at this film. That's basically what this review was an excuse to do. Get a few cheap laughs and views at the expense of a film I watched way too much as a kid. Still, I don't see any reason Disney wouldn't put it and the series on Disney+, Plus, aside from pure stubbornness, which may very well be the reason for the situation Buzz Lightyear Star Command finds itself in. Since according to Tad Stones, John Lasseter didn't come off as too fond of the series due to it not being the kind of Buzz Lightyear TV show he had envisioned. I'm not saying that's why it's probably never coming to Disney+, Plus, but that's probably why it's never coming to Disney+. Plus. So if you're a fan of old cartoons or just Buzz Lightyear in general, and can somehow find a way to watch Buzz Lightyear Star Command The Adventure Begins and the rest of the series, you should absolutely do so. Since it's still quite enjoyable, flaws and all. But until next time, this is Mad Silence signing out.